All right, so today's lecture, wait, this is so freaking weird. Why is this thing so high? There we go. All right. There we go. I, I need everyone on, on the, the Zoom link to read Idaho, Idaho, go, go, go on my freaking shirt, right? I got this at a thrift store, as I mentioned, everyone who was here early, and I was like, why is it $7.99? Uh, it fits perfect. It's really comfortable. There's a hole in the armpit, that's why. I realized why the person gave up a precious treasure like this. And I didn't realize when I bought it, see where the hole is. Somewhere in here. There, see, there's a little miniature there's hole. Two hole. There's two holes. <laughs> that, I was confused. Like, why would someone part with this? I would pay $195 for this thing. And it's seven bucks. I was like, there's, there's holes in it. Got it. Okay. We're talking about Rasputin today. This is one of our most uh, narrow lectures. Okay, the most one of the most tightly focused lectures in that the only thing we're talking about today is Rasputin. In fact, if you look at the syllabus, the title of this lecture is Verbatim Rasputin and Rumblings of Trouble from Russia through Early 1917. You can put a, a, a line through that because in about 10 days, I believe, somewhere in a two week time frame, we will return to Russia and we will talk about the rumblings of trouble at that point. In fact, we'll go back to the original time of troubles in the 17th century when in 1613 the Romanovs first take the throne. Why is that important for our class? Because right before the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 19, or excuse me, the First World War in 1914, the Romanovs celebrate 300 years of rule in 1913. Amazing fest festivities throughout the country. It's almost like it, it, it's darkest before the dawn. Here, sadly, it's like it's brightest before the fall. You know, in four years, you're gonna have the Russian Revolution, all this awful stuff. You look at, there were some bitter opponents of the Romanovs who were like, 300 years of rule, why not another 300? You know, we're never, we're never gonna get rid of the czar. He's, he's so popular, he's so awesome. Despite us hating him, thinking he's not awesome. People seem to love him. We'll talk all about that later. We're just gonna talk about rescue today. I'm gonna talk about 13 points right here from my notes. And then what I'm really excited about this is what you maybe didn't know what you all came for, but this is what you came for. Rasputin, Faith, Power, and the Twilight of the Romanovs by Douglas Smith, author of Former People. Rasputin is by far the most comprehensive account of Rasputin to date, brimming with the complexities and fascinating detail and sounds as an enlightening reevaluation of this crucial figure in history. Helen Rappaport from the Telegraph, United Kingdom. We're going to go through this point by point, all 700 pages, even if we stay here until the sunset, however long it takes. We're going to read every line we could about this man and explain why he is one of the, of the truly pivotal figures of the First World War. Who would I say are the most important figures of the First World War? Well, again, as a Catholic, and we're gaining towards this, and where does the Blessed Mother not figure in in all of human history, right? But the apparitions at Fatima, there's a singular event, right? And Our Lady and her message. Uh, people like, of course, Tsar Nicholas II, all of the leaders, Kaiser Wilhelm, of course, Eric Ludendorff, as he becomes later on dictator in the war, so to speak, his opponents would say, kind of like absolute power in Germany, the tail end of 1916. Um, there are a lot of these, these, these dominant overshadowing type characters, uh, Joffre for a while in France. Rasputin is one of these people. Okay, birth and Siberian home. Okay, Rasputin is born to a peasant family in the Siberian village of Pokrovskoy. Okay, P O K R O V S K O Y E. You can just say Siberia. All right, it's in Siberia. I think from the book, let me read to you a description of how romantic this is. I'm not, even, I'm not kidding at all. I'm being actually serious. And by romantic, I don't mean the notebook and whatever, whoever those people are. Um, Rachel McAdams and Ryan Gosling, right? And the notebook, yeah. I don't mean that way. I mean kind of like Siberia is the Texas of Russia, which is already Texas. Like that, that similar way in America where Texas is larger than life. And that's why we hate Texas, or that's why we love Texas. But no one is neutral. Like Texas has this outsized personality, the Lone Star State, everything's bigger here. Russia already has that as a country. And then add in Siberia. Siberia is like a combination of literally because of the 
the, the, the permafrost, the tundra, or even Alaska thing, but Alaska plus Texas, plus like West Virginia, super backwoods, hick, redneck. Let me give you one key immediately. The reason Rasputin is so popular in St. Petersburg is because he's a total redneck hick. It'd be like if Biden or Trump had a guy, not Duck Dynasty, the guy that makes Duck Dynasty guys look like really polished, like someone from West Virginia, he was his main advisor. Oh, you mean like Steve Bannon? Like Steve Bannon, yeah, exactly. Uh, Steve Bannon is the American rapper. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. God bless Steve Bannon. God have mercy on him like all of us. That might be a fair comparison. Uh, seriously. I mean, seriously, Steve Bannon as Ra American Rasputin, I've never made that connection. I know he's back, Bannon's been back in the news. They're trying to get him to testify for Congress or something, right? Yeah. But Bannon as kind of Rasputin, <laughs> like Bannon sometimes the way he, he appears to on TV, <laughs> it's like, I wonder if the dishevelment is intentional. You'll read in this book, Rasputin realized his appeal wasn't to be the third or second, the second, third or fourth man in the city. It was to be the first man in the country. Maybe Bannon has the same idea. That's part of my appeal to be this kind of like disheveled, all over the place, whatever kind of guy. You know, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's a hilarious joke. As so many things you say, that's actually very on point though. Okay, let me read to you where Rasputin comes from. This first paragraph from the book. Bordered on the north by the Arctic, o Arctic Ocean, on the south by the vast Central Asian steppe, Siberia stretches nearly 3,000 miles from the Ural Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. The train from Moscow to the Urals travels roughly a day and a night, and another five days from there to reach the Pacific. Were one to place the entire contiguous United States at the center of Siberia, there would still be nearly 2 million square miles of extra space. So the entire contiguous US can fit in Siberia, okay? But that's not enough of a, like, how big this place is. It is a land of pine and birch forests, of lakes and marshes. So already, it's a land of like grim fairy tales come true, like goblins and ghosts and stuff in forests and you know, swamps, alligators, right? People who eat gators, like in Louisiana Bayou, drained by a series of powerful rivers flowing north to the Arctic. It is a land of extremes. Temperatures can swing a staggering 188 degrees from lows of minus 95 Fahrenheit in the winter to 93 degrees in the summer. Mm -hmm. It is a severe, unforgiving place. Okay, so the first thing I have to realize about Rasputin, there are two main cities in Russia. And everyone, I don't have to even answer, I will, but in case anyone was confused, St. Petersburg and Moscow, or Moscow. We have St. Moscow here, whatever. Spelled exactly the same. Obviously, ours is named after theirs. Or, or maybe theirs was, was named after ours. I have to check. I forget. Um, but St. Petersburg is the European city. It is almost in Finland. It is, the goal of St. Petersburg is to have Paris in Russia. Moscow is the more traditional Orthodox. It's still in the Western part of the country, but it's about a thousand, a thousand kilometers, 600 miles, I think, from the Belarusian border. It's not in your, it, it's in Russia solidly. Those are the two main cities. In those areas, even Moscow, which is more quote unquote traditional, you have this cosmopolitan elite. Think of the people in Washington, DC, right? You know, inside the loop in Chicago, these people, fancy suits, lots of money, bankers, that is the world that Rasputin will win over, not by becoming like them, but being from this 188 degree marshy Arctic place larger than the US. And that he's this weird kind of guy that is that works for him. Everyone understands that, right? That's the appeal. Do not ask the questions I go through this. Why did he not change and become more polished? Why was he not the, the kid from West Virginia with the twang? I'll come right to you in one second, I promise. Who goes off to the, the JD Vance? That dude, uh, whatever, who's gonna run for Senate in Ohio, who wrote a book, what's it called? Freaking like Hillbilly Elegy. Yeah, that's what, Hillbilly Elegy, right. Yeah, that's not a Rasputin story. J.D. Vance is from this family, this even like admittedly dysfunctional family somewhere in Ohio, Appalachia somewhere. He goes to Yale, like gets a law degree, he's really polished. Rasputin never becomes polished. And he, uh, intentionally, he's like, people like that I'm not polished. He had really weird table manners, stuff like this. Nowadays, he'd probably get arrested for sexual assault. He would pinch the the bottoms of the um, of the czar's daughters, like they'd be sitting at the table and they like pop out of their chair. Rasputin would pinch. Oh, that's so funny, you know. Like that's just Rasputin being Rasputin, you know. Like today he'd get arrested, especially in the Me Too movement, he'd be arrested and prosecuted for sexual assault, right? Mm -hmm. But this is like he was this kind of super uncouth character with no manners, no boundaries. Please understand, we may be rightfully appalled by that. That's horrible. That was part of his appeal. People liked that because no one else acted like him. 
Claire, your question. Was it the general public in Lexington, or was it just poetry? That's not in your business. Um, next question, being honest, a question. Was it like the general public who like saw or who were also from like the outskirts? Fantastic question. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. It's a, it's a really great, great question. Very, great layered question. We're going to talk about the media reaction to him. He becomes, like a lot of media figures, lionized and then quickly demonized in the media. The media is obsessed by him. He sells papers. Only bad publicity is no publicity. The media both say yeah. he's amazing and they make him out to be a demon. They write horrible, like sexual cartoons about him in his arena, like awful stuff. That he's like secretly sleeping with her, manipulating, he's just a poison demon, he's the antichrist. In fact, the, the, the view on Rasputin ranges from that he's a holy man of God, so he's actually serving the devil. Like it's zero to 100. It's not, there's no in between. To answer your question, here, I don't know if you know how great the question was because the second point you made, the people in Moscow and St. Petersburg aren't common people. Even if they're kind of peasants, they're in the city, they're kind of, they're still cosmopolitan. Think about your average New Yorker, your average person who lives in Colfax, Washington. They're not the same like normal person, right? Everyone in New York is a big city person, even the kind of the simple people. So Rasputin, there are no Siberian people in St. Petersburg and Moscow, basically. Like he's a freak show attraction, right? Uh, people love him. And the, 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 the czar and the czarina love him more than the people, probably. That's the whole point. That's the problem with the top-down society in Russia as we would see it. Look at the abuses that happen when people at the top get to kind of determine everything. The people at the, the bottom um, are kind of jealous of him. I'm jealous of his influence with the czar and the czarina. So I hate his guts. I hate that Alexander loves him. Um, so, so people kind of hate him. He has this inc incident at the yard, it's called, where it's really awkward, where he apparently is bragging about like that he hooks up with the czarina. I don't want to, you know, I'm seriously taking the Ten Commandments very seriously, not bearing false witness, even against a guy like Rasputin. I don't want to, I don't know if it's exactly to that extent, but he's kind of flaunting like whatever. And then, by the way, there's no, from what I understand, there's no evidence that her, her and Rasputin ever had a kind of adulterous affair. No. That was completely media like garbage. Alexander loved him because it was the Tsarina, because he apparently could miraculously heal their son who struggled with hemophilia, was afflicted by hemophilia. The Rasputin, I think, is like bragging at like imagine for an Etsy Bravo, um, that he's you know, he's he's in with the Tsar, I'm so cool, and then he gets naked. <laughs> and the cops have to come. <laughs> like every good party. Then he starts he takes his clothes off. And this guy really has no, he has no boundaries. <laughs> And so he, at that point, I think after the incident in the yard, he disrobes publicly, they're like, he's absolutely crazy. Like he might, he might be serving the devil, but he's also a total idiot. But the czar and the czarina still love him. Does anyone know what his main feature was? Or the, the, the czar love him? I know, we know. Yeah, the, the czar does. does. The czar does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the czar, the czar first meets him in 1905, refers to him as a special friend, holy man of God. And that really kind of never falls away. His advisors hate him. Uh, sorry, you know, Alexander writes a letter to Nikolai Nikolaevich, who is the Grand Duke. He's the head of the army for Tsar will take, Tsar will take over. And the Tsarina gushes about him. Our special friend wants to come bless the troops on the front. And Nikolai Nikolaevich writes, Your Empress, with respect, if Rasputin shows up on the front, we'll hang him immediately. <laughs> 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 like, don't send him here if you want to be. We're, gonna act, we're not joking. We're literally going to kill him if he comes out. We hate this man. So, a lot of the pop culture people just like thought he was just like a, a drunk scumbag disgusting again you know thank god now like with, with the me too, me too movement where those things are completely unacceptable back then they were more acceptable he was still unacceptable like he would just like fawn the women in public even then that was like this is horrible like he's just total pervert kind of that's what a lot of people thought about him uh mm. even even then but the he also had this outside legend his main feature you know what his main feature was his eyes his eyes yeah people talk about like you were like you were one guy so once I think of this Walker, <laughs> Walker Percy novel. Walker Percy is the greatest writer of all time. Walker Percy, the movie goer, says the end, poor bastard, in relation to like, explaining the story. He's like, his housekeeper was this real, like, this, this butler and this thing was this real, like, stuck up guy who's better than everyone. <laughs> and Walker Percy's like, it finally made sense. Binks Bowling, the character, like, it finally made sense. One time I was walking around the house and I saw, like, Alfred's book laid out there and it was entitled, the nine steps to harnessing your secret energy. <laughs> it's like, poor bastard. Like, this guy actually believes in, like, you know, mental tricks and stuff. A guy who was like that, who was like that, who is this, this kind of stupid pseudoscience, almost like an astrological kind of crap, at this time believed, like, you could, like, win people with your eyes and whatever. And so he recounts this weird story of Rasputin, like, me and Rasputin went at it. 
in this like astrological, cosmological secret power battle, but he didn't seduce me. Like not, not in a sexual way, but like he didn't like, you know, make me like, give me uh, my social security number, give me his bank account information. <laughs> Rasputin apparently with women and men had this like reputation, like being able to own you with his eyes. Like he reputedly, you know, like hooked up with a billion women because he could seduce any woman with his eyes. He would make men who hated him, who wanted to like challenge him to duel pistols, like, yeah, like give him money because he could like, you know, so they how do you feel about the deal? You know, like he was like, like yeah, like, eat you with his eyes. Everything about this guy is really, really freaking weird. If you haven't noticed, okay. <laughs> if I haven't made that clear enough. Okay, so Stranik, Strani, a wanderer or pilgrim. All right. So Rasputin, he's born by the way in 1869. All right. So just for your information, he's 31, the turn of the century. When everything's going on, his his heyday. His like 1914 to 18, you know, the, the first world war heyday, he's in his 40s this time. He's like mid-40s, right? Born in 1869, early 1900, when he's about my age, early 30s, he decides, like, I'm gonna go to wander and find myself. The original uh, eat, pray, love, I'm gonna go find who I am, right? His wife is long suffering and insanely faithful. His wife, like, God bless her. Put up with so much garbage, like whatever he did. <laughs> Even once, like people came complaining to her that, like, your husband like hooks up with every woman in the world. She's like, "Well, I'm not. I can't judge him." <laughs> Instead of being like, "Hey, our marriage is over. Like he's done. Show me where he is and get me a weapon, and then we're gonna straighten this out." She's like, "Well, you know, he, he needs to do what he needs to do, or something like that." Like, wow. Seriously, his wife like is like either positive, the ultimate like amazing woman of God who had endless like true mercy and forgive her the ultimate enabler. Like hey, your husband's an alcoholic. Yeah, well, I just keep supplying his beer and that's fine. Like literally she anyway she they have kids and they live in this backwards town in Siberia in West Virginia in the middle of nowhere. And she's like, yeah, you can go off on pilgrimages, you know, go off as long as you want, whatever. And apparently he often would seek the company of young women on these pilgrimages, which wasn't scandalous at all, right? Sarcasm. But his wife was like, that's fine, you know. So rescued already the early 1900 has this like kind of, I don't want to say spiritual awakening, but something kind of like that, where he's been kind of an illiterate village peasant, just a nobody in the middle of nowhere, but he goes off and kind of, he at least feels like he finds enlightenment. All right. Okay. So he, in 1897, at this time, he's what, almost 28 years old. He visits St. Nicholas Monastery and he claims this, uh, this transform, transforms him. He returns to Pokorovskoye, a changed man, looking disheveled, behaving differently, becoming a vegetarian. He swears off alcohol and prays and sings much more fervently than he had in the past. People claim it's possible he went as far as Mount Athos, which is the, in Greece, the center of orthodoxy. All right. So early life, he, again, not a lot is known. In fact, early life and wife, we'll talk about his wife in a second. Douglas Smith, this biographer, says it's a black hole about which we know almost nothing about his early life. People claim he was a horse thief, an al uh, a drunkard, that he disrespected local authorities, was insubordinate, womanizer. All of this is kind of hearsay. To be fair to Rasputin, God have mercy on his soul. He's a crazy human being. I hope he's in heaven. I hope he repented for whatever he had to repent for. It. All people. Did. Say, lead, lead, lead all souls to heaven, especially those Muslim members. Right? That would be bad prayer. God have mercy on To be fair to Rasputin, so much of his it's like Chuck Norris stories, some of it. Like there's, it's like there's a kernel of truth and there's like a million truths. So it, literally Rasputin, if he like, you know, was playing blackjack with someone, cards even, the story the next day would be that Rasputin like organized the blackjack game, which six, six people got shot and robbed them all. And like, you know, and he levitated at some point too. Like it's just like crazy, all this kind of big fish story embellishment. There's a lot of that. His wife is a peasant girl named Praskovaya, P-R-A-S-K-O-V. Y A, okay. He actually meets her on one of her, one of his travels. This place called Abalok. They court for a couple months. They end up having seven children, but only three survive to adulthood. You know, tragically at this time, God rest their souls, the infant mortality rate, especially in like a you know Siberian outpost. But his wife Praskovaya, the thing you know about her mostly, she really is an incredibly faithful woman. She's dedicated to him. Maybe he seduced her with his eyes too, you know, and like the, she's forever faithful to him, even though he treats her like absolute garbage, in my opinion. Like just leaves home for months at years at a time sometimes. Always in the con. He even brought like girlfriends home to their house, I think. Like, like oh, it's my special friend. You know, it's like so effing awkward. Just horrible. 
Seriously. Really, in a certain way, that's like the most, I think one of the most things I find the most offensive about Rasputin is the way he treated his wife. Um, so much of his behavior towards women is, is unacceptable and offensive, but this woman that was devoted to him, he seems to really not, I don't know, just not care of what she thinks at all. Um, and take advantage of the fact that she's so understanding of his you know, back to his activities. Uh, where are we here? Uh, okay, Seven Lakes Monastery is a place too where he, where he heads off to. These are all part of his early kind of experiences. Again, Stranik, okay, or Astaris. Under, understand Rasputin as Stranik, uh, as Stranik as Starex. Rasputin at equals that, meaning this reputation of a holy wise man wandering the countryside dispensing wisdom. Okay, like for lack of a better word. Imagine a guy walks through Moscow. Let's seriously play a, a, a hypothetical game. He walks through Moscow and he's dressed like Christ and he's carrying a cross and he's claiming, you know, I'm, I'm in Moscow, I'm working my way to the Pacific. I'm, I was inspired by the book, The Invocation of Christ. I've decided to dedicate my life to re repenting for sins by doing this penance of carrying this cross that I built in my own hands from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. A lot of people would mock that. A lot of people would find it's very weird, but some people would be really intrigued, right? That's really interesting, right? It's really, that's an interesting way to like, you know, imitate our Lord. Rasputin has this kind of like outsized personality in this way that his weirdness, he would at times go out in the forest and pray for hours at night. Like it just, he almost has this kind of St. Francis monastic kind of weird appeal in, in, in a certain sense. Okay. I'll get to this in the book. The thing I like most about Rasputin was he really was not a judgmental person. It's actually very, very interesting. Maybe he was giving himself license. Maybe because he did every possible vice. It's like, well, that's why he's not judgmental, obviously, because he's swimming in sin. So he doesn't. But it's true, even when his enemies like hated their guts, even when his enemies like tried to assassinate him, he was like, well, I don't know if I'm the bad guy. <laughs> like to be fair to him, like if you organized to try to kill me after like a three month publicity campaign uh, in the papers, you know, mud race campaign, lies, libel. And I'm like, well, he's not, he's actually not a bad guy. You know, like Rasputin, that was, that's maybe his most warm characteristic. He actually was not a vindictive person. He lived kind of vengeance his mind, save the Lord. Um, now I'm not saying that makes him a good guy, <laughs> I'm just saying that he did actually, he didn't have this kind of like mean-spirited character. I don't know, for whatever that's worth. St. Petersburg elite. Rasputin's strange manners made him the subject of intense curiosity among St. Petersburg elite. The historian Joseph Fullman says they were bored, cynical, and above all, seeking new experiences. Right. The St. Petersburg elite are the, the oligarchs today. I have every house in every country and tons of money and private jets. I hate life. In fact, Walker Percy talks about Lost in the Cosmos. The more stuff you have, the more likely you are to be depressed. That's, again, this isn't, that's not, ooh, it's so deep. It's not deep. Everyone knows this. But yet we still breathlessly chase you know, material goods. St. Petersburg elite, people in these salons had everything. They were looking for new stuff. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to have another effing, you know, like impressionist painting ex exhibition or another like, ooh, another recital of freaking Mozart's best pieces. Like they, they had all that high culture. They want a guy who eats with his hands and like it's disgusting and uncouth. That's really cool. We've never seen an animal like this, right? So that's been already, the, the, the bed is laid, the ground is fertile for him to become insanely popular. Despite what I said to you, Claire, maybe about the popularity is infamy and they hate him, but the fascination of because they're really bored of life. The people in St. Petersburg, the people around the turn of the century, like everything is going so good, it sucks. Just life is just one humdrum thing after another. Ooh, another painting. Oh, no. Wow, another recital. You know, like, show me something I've never seen. He really is unlike anything they've ever seen. First meeting with the royal family in the BNC. Rasputin first meets the Tsar on November, November 1st, 1905, at Pet Peterhof Palace. The Tsar records the event in this way Me and Alexandra had made the acquaintance of a man of God, Grigory, from Tolbos province. Okay, his first impression is, I mean, immediately in the back. He's a man of God. That's how I, Nicholas, look at him. I'm the emperor. Despite there being genetical hereditary succession, you know, emperor, it's not a meritocracy thing. You have to still have some kind of head screwed on somewhat straight to be freaking emperor. Especially because even if you're, even if, <laughs> even if you're a moron, and Nicholas wasn't, I, like, I actually like Nicholas a lot. But even if you're a moron, you're going to be afforded the best education. You're going to be told by people who are very smart, this is how you act, don't do this way. So it's interesting that he's not first Elias as kind of charlatan. Right? His first impression is like, oh, he's, he seems to me like the, the legit stranic, a legit guy of uh, country wisdom, whatever. Um, the way that they become super, super, he becomes ingratiated with the family is A, B, A, C, and especially an I. 
All right. Remember, Alexi, the Zarevich, the next Zar, has hemophilia. His blood doesn't, everyone knows what hemophilia is, right? And I don't have to, like Claire is our resident medical expert. You don't have to be a future doctor to know what hemophilia is. No one understands even the basic idea of hemophilia and how, how scary and dangerous it can be for um, even getting a small bruise if you got these hematomas, et cetera. Well, apparently Rasputin could heal Alexi of his hematoma. That is just check mark forever, take it to the bank. Alexander, like all good moms, loves her son. If this guy saves my boy's life, he's forever my friend, period, right? And it's scandalous and awful how the press will make it. The press is just as bad as today. Same fake news, whatever kind of stuff. The same, nothing has changed that. But it's scandalous how the press will make it this sexual thing. Oh, Rasputin probably is sleeping with her. So actually, the, with all the people that Rasputin probably slept with, might have been hundreds of women to take pictures, but really, his dad has gone bad. But the Tsarina was not one of them. Um, I'm not saying it's like defending her honor, just no evidence that there was any sexual relationship. It simply was, he heals my son. So he's my friend, his family forever. Um, the summer of 1912, this miracle at Spawa, which is a Polish town, and the L with a slash through, just for anyone who's interested in the Polish language, L with a slash through is a W sound. That's why my name, my last name, WSKI, it's not, it's not Krzyzewski, it's Krzyzewski, W's in Polish, V's, the W sound is L with a slash, slash through. Spawa is this kind of hunting lodge in Poland. Alexei develops a big hematoma beneath the skin from a bumpy carriage ride. Rasputin telegrams Alexandra, God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve. The little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him. The next day he's healed. Hmm. And the doctors are like, yeah, I have no idea what happened. Alexandra, of course, coincidence or not, attributes to Rasputin with intercession. He says, he's astronic. He's this holy man of God. He therefore did something. Uh, number 10, Lampa Geek and Rasputin Nove. Rasputin Nove is so tool bag. It's just such disgusting, like Rasputin, like licking boots until his tongue falls out of his mouth. Like he goes to Nicholas, know that he's new in, in Russian and Polish, um, and probably every Slavic, Slavic language. Uh, so Rasputin knew. It's so weeping tool. I want to seriously punch myself in the juggler right now. He goes to Nicholas and he's like, oh, Czar, being around you has changed my life. Dear Czar, grant thy, thy humble servant permission to doth change my name to new Rasputin. Permission grant, just, just tool bag, you know, it's just like such sucking up. But Nicholas loves it, right? Like, oh, look, I've like I've had this, you know, I've had this effect on him, and he's a new man because of me. We're gonna make it official. We're gonna walk down to the courthouse together and get his name officially changed. Kanye West got his name officially changed to Yay. Like, this is the Rasputin new and Nova. The, the, the artist formerly known as Rasputin, Rasputin Nova, new limited edition disc release featuring Dave Schmidt. Um, okay, Lampa Dick is, is, is lamplighter. <laughs> he's given a, a formal title. He's given a job. Hey, we know you're a Siberian bum who just goes around and like acts really awkward. You want an actual like fake position? <laughs> this never happens in real politics now. <laughs> There's no bureaucrats in any government that have fake jobs, right? Who do nothing to get paid money, right? Especially nepotistic things that comes out of none of that. We've done that like that. This is how dumb this job is. Charged with keeping the lamps lit before religious icons in the house. <laughs> I just like, I am, and you know, God help me, God have mercy on me. I am a devout, devout Catholic, and God help me. I love this idea. Keep the lamps lit to pray more, to be closer to God. That's beautiful. I'm saying the job seems like it's fake. Like, aren't there Orthodox priests in the temple who do this? Like, oh, no, no, no you're not going to do this anymore. He's going to go around. He has to personally wipe the lamps. You know, can't some like eight year old kid wipe the lamps? Who a real intricate job here, you know? So, so I, I, think, I was thinking about being like finance minister. No, I just go wipe the lamps. Um, make sure the house doesn't burn down. Okay. Now, this is the most damning accusation given against Rasputin. That he was a member of the Clist sect. Clist means whips. And this is exactly where this is going. This is kind of like sadomasochistic, like gross sexual stuff. Rasputin was accused, also in his defense, of no, with no evidence, of being part of like sex orgy cults. That was the biggest thing about him. Now, it's almost 100% true, and God have mercy on him. One adulterous liaison is damnable, is horrible. And he likely had hundreds. So this is not like, oh, actually, he wasn't a bad guy. Like, he hooked up with so many women, married women, single women, and, you know, fornication, adultery, every possible sexual sin, he was deeply involved. So that's horrible, horrible, God have mercy. But in his defense, to always be, I don't, there is no evidence he's actually part of the sect. And the sect was basically something like you'd imagine in Woodstock, 
people do a bunch of drugs, get naked together, and have sex with everyone, and no one really knows what's going on. It's kind of awful, but literally like scenes from hell that just, you know, Roman orgy type stuff. Rasputin was always connected to these people. That was always the insult. Uh, you know, I don't know. Imagine your, your least favorite politician. Maybe there's always a way that you like insult that person with a, a go-to thing. Oh, they did this, right? This is it for Rasputin. Whenever the conversation got built up, and like Sophia was defending Rasputin, I'm like, well, you know he's eclipsed. Like that was always the kind of Trump part. And it, it wasn't true. It was like, oh wait, okay, maybe I should it was shut down the conversation. Right? If he does that, that really is beyond the real. St. Petersburg was really scumbag. St. Petersburg, again, kid yourself not. Did, how long will God stay his just punishment on the earth? World War I, I'm convinced in some ways it's punishment for sin. This place is this this Russia at the turn of the century was just as sexually corrupt as Las Vegas and Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not like, oh, they were so pure and good there. People in the, they're, they're, they're like pastime in these salons, like having adulterous flings and whatever, you know, like hooking up with everyone. Like it was horrible. These people were not, again, God have mercy, these were not like good moral examples. The point is that for most people, the cliffs were even a step too far. Like that was taking it too far, right? Like you can do like normal stuff, don't go there. That was always the main kind of like prod against Rasputin. He's part of this, this group. Rasputin, though, did now in his what's what's in, in, in his prosecution. What's the opposite to say here? Um, I've defended him now. Let's, let's attack him. Rasputin did have this awful idea that unless you sin, you can't repent. If you don't repent, you can't be saved. Therefore, sin, which is horrible, right? Like, how about you realize like you're a sinner, to repent. Rasputin believed in like purposely committing sin so you could be forgiven. Like, imagine how awesome it's going to be when you repent. Well, let's do all this simple stuff first. Like, he did kind of hold to that theory. So he was like, it was really good to have, like, you know, all these, like, 10 weeks of, like, crazy fornication with everyone. That was awesome because that would make you more sorrowful realizing how bad you were. And then you could, the repentance would be so much sweeter. This is obviously horrible. This is, do not follow this theology, right? This is, this is like, satanic antichrist theology. This is literally the three constituent parts of mortal sin, right? Full consent of the will, total knowledge. And this is just right there's no there's no other way to talk about this in catholic practices if you purposely commit sin and you know there's sin and you're doing it because it's part of your plan of like salvation like i'm going to do much of this stuff and later on i'll you know the salvation will be much sweeter that, that's wrong but anyone know who who kind of is like this person i really really admire and love who's kind of like this saint augustine augustine famously quipped i'm not going to do the hearts quote everyone knows that quote anyone know what augustine famously said Make me chase yeah, make me chase just not yet. I want to have some more fun for a little bit longer. Then make me <laughs> chase. This is the exact same policy, right? I know I shouldn't do this, but I really like doing this a lot, and I like it. So I want chastity, but not right now. So Augustine kind of has this kind of philosophy too. You know, this great, great doctor of the church. Thank God, by the grace of God, when he repented, he was repented forever. It wasn't like, okay, I repent now. I'm going to sin even more to repent more, and this cycle of indulgence, like it's almost like a bulimia thing, right? Like. I'm going to keep sucking my face of cake and then purposely vomit and keep going again and again and again, right? This vicious cycle. Summer of 1914, Rasputin has an attempt on his life by a woman named Chinoya Guseva. Guseva claimed to have acted alone, having read about Rasputin in the newspapers, Claire, having read about him in the newspapers, and then believing him to be, quote, a false prophet, even an antichrist. Um, okay. The reports believe this rival monk named Iliador, whose own story is so crazy, we'll do a whole lecture on him. But we won't. Uh, Iliador tried to assassinate Rasputin. Remember, I had it last class, 1914. That was the great year of assassinations. Franz Ferdinand and Sophie and the child, their unborn child, God rest their souls. That is a successful attempt. So is Jean Joris in France, the socialist leader. Rasputin's attempt fails, right? This woman stabs him in the stomach, but he survives. Uh, <clears throat> finally, 1916, the end, Rasputin is assassinated. Um, in December of 1916. I'm going to read you the assassination attempt point by point in the Douglas Smith book. We're going to move now to the line by line examples drawn from the Rasputin biography, which I'm really excited for. Which you can see here, here's all my line for line stuff. Hope we can get through all of it in the next 20 minutes. Um, this has been going great so far. Hope it continues that way. Um, Eli Loman, thank you for your presence in class. You're the probably top 17 coolest people alive right now. Good job. I, know, I don't know where you fall in that number. Might be, yeah, it might be 16, might be five, but definitely. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, where is it going with this? Before I go off on you know, these tangents, they're self inflicted tangents. It makes me forget my train of thought. It's my fault. Um, oh, I'm going to talk to you about this point by point. 
But basically, I can tell you the story right now to prep you. Rasputin's invited to a party. They try to poison him, doesn't poison him. They tell him at one point, hey, look at that icon there. Say your prayers. You turn around, they shoot him. That doesn't work. Uh, the rest of like wakes up, he's been shot, he's been poisoned, but he's still alive. They have to like, throw him out a window, they shoot him like a thousand times, throw him in a river. And the legend adds that when the autopsy was discovered, there was water in the lungs. So despite being shot 65 times, thrown in a river off a bridge and poisoned, he still was like, he died under the icy river. That's not true. Uh, that, that's fake news. Even this guy says here, um, Douglas Smith is like, that's really cool Chuck Norris story. The rest of was so indestructible, he still was alive. That's not true. Definitely when he was shot 50 times. <laughs> It's not funny. I mean, like, really, this is not funny. I'm sorry for laughing. Um, but like but that, but that did it. He's a human being. He was he was dead at that point. Um, okay. Douglas Smith. What a freaking pretentious name, right? Ooh. Oh, Professor Douglas. Can't go by Doug, right? Douglas, right? Okay. Uh, let's set the stage. <laughs> Says the guy with a name no one can pronounce. Okay, so Douglas Smith roast me feedback. I'm destroyed. All right. <laughs> Win Douglas Smith. Douglas Smith won. Guy who we can't say zero. Um, okay. Page 89. Here's the awesome setup for 1890 to 1914, turn of the century. D Douglas Smith, I'm not kidding, guys. I recommend getting this book. I really recommend getting this book. It reads like a novel. Douglas Smith, all jokes aside, I'll stop mocking him. There's nothing to mock. He's a freaking genius and an incredible writer. I like good writing. I mean, who doesn't? But I mean, you can tell him like this writing sucks, but the story's cool. He's a beautiful writer. He writes like a novelist, and the, it's it's amazing. So I, re I recommend you getting it. Um, and I told you again, it makes my mouth water for Cuckoo Country cycling. Because over the summer, I had probably four of the course for this book. Marie, have you had one? We have to take a field trip to Cuckoo Country and get cycles around Christmas time. My tree, guys. <laughs> I come into your country throwing Icelandic This is being recorded, right? What? This is being so, recorded, yeah. All right, so we have this promise. Yeah. I, why, why not? I think it'd be kind of fun either. All right. <laughs> wait, guys, wait, though. No, around Christmas time. But you guys have to come to Poland. I live in Poland, so I'll freaking just be chilling in Poland like the man, and you guys have to come across the border. So if you guys can make the trip to Poland, we'll do a your country, for real. But we, but, well, I can't say we have to get cyclones. I don't want to force it on you. Like, <laughs> you know, if you want to, your choice. But I highly recommend it. That's a way like, you know, I'll, I'll mandate it, but I'll allow exemptions to cyclones. <laughs> depending upon okay. The turn of the century was a period of intense spiritual searching in Russia. Intellectuals turned away from the materialist positivism in the 19th century, meaning like through science, through the material world was continue to move on linear progress. Oh, now they fall into depression. Back to the church and other forms of spiritualism, which we call a true religious renaissance. But not really. Spiritualism, seances, or anything but religion. It's more like demonology, right? Many sought to re revitalize what was widely per perceived as a hidebound, bureaucratic, and spiritually dead official Russian, Russian Orthodox Church, and to infuse it with a renewed sense of mystery, fervency, and light. Okay, that sounds like a great set up for our guy to reinvigorate the whole Russian church, this true man of God, as Nicholas said, this Stranik, who's going to come from the Siberian wilderness, come from West Virginia, and teach people about what, what matters in life, and how to live on fire for God. Okay. Uh, I'm literally just reading kind of excerpts. That's okay with you guys. These are fascinating, I think. But if you're like, what's the connection? The main lecture was kind of, that's this whole story, but like, here's just, so just we're going to kind of listen to stories. Um, this is the, um, you just kind of will follow me, kind of chronologically in order, the story I just gave you. Maria, Rasputin's daughter, who had not been born at the time of his transformation, wrote that her father had, the father had drunk and smoked and eaten meat just like other peasants, but suddenly things changed. He gave all these things up and began to undertake pilgrimages to distant places. In one edition of her memoirs, Maria claimed that her father had had a vision. While out in the fields, Holy Mary appeared in the sky and pointed towards the horizon. Rasputin felt that the Virgin was watching over him, directing him to wander as a holy seeker. He spent an entire night alone with an icon of Mary. The next morning, he awoke to see tears streaming down her face. He heard a voice, I am weeping for the sins of mankind, Grigory. Go wander and cleanse the people of their sins. Now, is that complete and utter BS or true? I don't know. I'm serious, right? Seriously. Tell, tell me who here, I love Christ in a uh, 
one of the Gospels, when you reprimand people asking, is John's baptism of heavenly or human origin, right? And because they're asking, like, where do you come from your authority? And if, 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 if the people are like, if we say it's from heavenly origin, then they'll ask, why do you believe him? And if we say it's of human origin, we, we hear the crowd, they'll kill us. And Christ said, oh, I won't tell you either. I don't know. I don't know. I know I love being Catholic for this reason. Is that people claim our lady comes and the church will say, no, that's, that's wrong. That's false. Like, I don't ever heard of the Bayside apparitions. That's false. The church has declared that's completely wrong. That woman, whether she had mental issues or was just lying or got a mercy on her, just it's not, it's not credible. The church has declared Fatima is credible. It's worthy of belief. So it's Guadalupe, etc. A lot of you don't know. Somewhere in New Jersey, this woman who is like good Italian grandmother, kind of warm American, but claims she has private relations. It's been completely, as far as I know, completely and utterly debunked. Like just completely false. Like do not believe this. It can be spiritually dangerous for your soul actually to believe this. Uh, because some people do get private relations, but they're not from whom they think from, right? Um, it can be from other spirits, right? We, we fight principalities and powers. So it could not, well, not only be like not true, but also bad. I don't know if anyone knows this. The church has never proclaimed on Medjugorje. You guys know this. You know a lot of people who are very pro Medjugorje, I would say, be careful. You'll, you won't find a, a bigger fan of Our Lady than me. I pray the rosary every single day. God help me, I will for the rest of my life. I love the Blessed Mother. I can't wait to talk about her in December. Um, really, like, absolutely, like almost emotional, cheesy, like tears of joy. I love her. That doesn't change the fact that not every place where people have a positive experience associated with her is it to be believed. Medjugorje, a lot of people say, wait, we don't know. I know a lot of like, Medjugorje fanatics. Um, and Fatima and Guadalupe go all the way. Like they've been officially and forever approved. Lourdes approved. Medjugorje, we don't know yet. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm saying we don't, do not believe the hype of some people who are like, oh yeah, definitely. The church has never said, has not given it the status yet. We'll see. This is a total private revelation. This could be a complete lie, a complete nonsense, and evil. Even if, if you if you think that the blessed mother talked to you, that's I think that's a, a serious sin. Obviously, that, that's worse. You should shut your mouth. Shouldn't have said anything in the first place. But could it be true? I don't know. Right? I have no idea. Yeah. Just like side note, but we were running off uh, psychosis, and a lot of people do have these religious, like it is like one of these, but they'll have like sure. these religious grandiose mm -hmm. ideas. The truth will set you free. That there is real religion. And there's Tons of fake religion. There's tons of John of the Cross, epic baller level saint. I believe it was him. He talked about how he would always know if someone's being serious. And he uh, he said that some woman was claiming to have like the relations of our Lord or our Lady in town. And he went out there, and this woman like burst out of the door. She's like, "I'm glad you're here. I can't wait to tell you about the relations they fought." And he left. And he's like, "I knew immediately." He's like, "Anyone who this happens to really, it's terrifying. It's unbelievable." We all believe in the reality of these things when, they're, when the, that veil is broken. It's very scary. You don't brag about it. If you're bragging about it, yeah, Jesus talks to you. You're a liar about it. Who, you know, who was the first one? Like, it's John of the Cross. Okay. Like he knew right away. Like if people are like proud about this thing. It's not. It's fake. Mm -hmm. We're just guessing. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of psychosis. There's a lot of people. And, and tell me the guy in the mental institution who said he's Napoleon. Tell me that he's uh, he's wrong. I mean, he'll be thought of rational proof. But no, I really am Napoleon. I'm Napoleon reincarnated. There's, there's lots of mental stuff, right? And that's, that's no surprise to me. Straniki, holy wanderers, religious pilgrims were a common sight in old Russia. Many of these pilgrims, I do this prayer too, I recommend it. It's a beautiful prayer. As they went, the pilgrims would repeat the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me a sinner. I highly recommend that prayer. I really do. It's a beautiful prayer. The Russian Orthodox people will do it like on rosary beads. They don't pray the rosary, sadly, the Orthodox. But they do this Jesus prayer. And I'll do it all on these over and over again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's like a mantra almost. Really cool. Really beautiful prayer. Look what's so beautifully tacked on. Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord, who is the Son of God. Please have mercy upon me. Who am I, a sinner? Freaking awesome. Great, beautiful prayer. I just feel bad saying freaking in relation to a prayer. Sorry. But beautiful prayer. Really good prayer. Awesome prayer. Um, Rasputin humiliated, humiliated himself for days, testing resolve. Fasting, that sounds pretty good. He forced himself to go without food or water for days. For six months, he wandered without changing his underclothes. Wow. Or touching his body. <laughs> but he touched other people's bodies, unfortunately. For three years, he traveled across Russia in fetters. In age-old Christian fashion, his mortification of flesh brought him closer to the spirit of Christ. When bandits robbed him, he gave them everything he said, saying, it's not mine, it's from God. They're astonishing. A little food he had, he would share with his fellow Straniki, for it all came with God. Came from God. Okay. 
Uh, the years spent wandering were Rasputin's universe. Okay, so this peasant unlearned guy who probably was illiterate for a large part of his life in this wandering thing. Trisha's getting really into Rasputin. I can see she's like, hmm. She's, she's putting Rasputin on trial. Her mind. She's like, she likes what she hears so far. A lot of penance, a lot of like, you know, sharing food with people. Trish respects and likes his ideals. We'll see how the story continues to go. Um, Maria never forgot. Maria, again, is not our Maria from Wyoming. This is Maria from Russia. Um, just to be clear, I love the interaction with you guys. This is not, I want to give Maria endless props. One of the coolest people in the world too. But this is not our Maria. This is Maria Brasky, his daughter. Never forgot how he, how he told the beautiful woman with the features of the Holy Virgin, Virgin who appeared before him and spoke of God. When he had finished, he reflexively made the sign of the cross over his children's heads. God's God was life's consolation, Rasputin believed. Rasputin told them, and he told them this, and he taught them how to pray. Not everyone could do it, he said. One had to believe in one's heart and banish all thoughts from one's mind, leaving nothing behind but God. He forced his children to fast as preparation for prayer and instructed them that they, they did this not for their health, as educated Russians believe, but for the salvation of our souls. That is an amazing, beautiful comment. Intermittent fasting. A lot of people do intermittent fasting today. Why do they do it? I don't have six pack abs. I want to look great on the beach, you know, for my boyfriend, that kind of stuff, right? Are those intrinsically bad things? I don't think they're intrinsically bad. If you're doing it to like hook up with a million people like Rasputin, then yes, it's bad. Please stop, right? If you're doing it to live like spring break culture, then that, that's bad, um, <laughs> right? But that's not intrinsically bad to fast for your health, to have your blood sugar levels be better, to have good like, homeostasis in your body and you look good, that's fine. But the reason we fast as Christians ultimately is to mortify ourselves for God. We understood this. As educated Russians believed in the St. Petersburg elite, they thought, oh, it's all about, you know, we're doing it to, to look more beautiful, have cleaner skin. It's like, no, it's for the salvation of souls. I hear you, Church. She sounds pretty good so far, right? What, well, what's wrong with this guy exactly? Um, okay, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to take you through the whole book. I'm not even kidding you. Um, in the reign of Catherine the Great, many young officers at court dreamed of becoming the official favorite of the empress as the way to secure his future and fortune. So in the reign of Nicholas, did any number of mystics, Staniki, and Star Startsy hope to occupy the place of seer to the royal couple? That's indeed going to be his big breakthrough. We talked about November 1st, 1905, All Saints Day, Nicholas saying, I met a holy man of God. That's what he's seeking in some ways. Maybe even unintentionally. Maybe actually to his credit, the rest of isn't seeking that. He's trying just to follow God's will, and he stumbles into it. Claire, these guys make people hate it. I wanted to be seer to the royal couple. I was the best. Anyone seen the movie Amadeus? Mozart movie? Yeah. There's some guy, I forget his name, whatever the main guy is, but he hates Mozart because he's not as good as him. What's his name? Yeah. yeah, that's the exact idea. And he hates Mozart. He's not like, oh, Mozart's a great man. I hate this guy because I'm jealous of him. There's a lot of jealousy towards Rasputin. Why does this guy get to be Alexander's favorite? Why is he her main guy? And again, I'm telling you, in defense of the Tsarina's holy purity, you should pray. You know, there is no evidence at all that oh yeah, Rasputin seduced her in the bedroom. There's nothing like that. That happened tons of times. That was he did that all the time. Um, he was very popular with the kind of you know, no offense, sorry, but the kind of scumbag women of St. Petersburg who were so bored. That's all they look for is the next kind of tryst. That happened a lot with Rasputin, sadly, not with the Tsarina. His influence was solely on the Tsarina. Tsarina too was extremely religious, very spiritual, very deep faith in God. So was Nicholas. And they had a beautiful marriage too. I mentioned this before, but they truly love each other. They're faithful to one another. I don't know any evidence too of Nicholas having mistresses and stuff, which is extremely common. They are, apparently were faithful to one another and very deeply religious and bound even more by the suffering of their hemophiliac son. Rasputin's entry there was that they both believed for whatever reason that he wasn't the holy man of God and he'd be able to suffer. That's what we talked about. Okay, here's a description of Rasputin, I think. And in fact, I'm going to read you a bunch of character descriptions, eight of them just to give you a feel for this guy. Um, generally speaking, Rasputin was truly out of the ordinary person in terms of his sharp mind and religious focus. You had to see him, the way he prayed in the cathedral. He stood just like a string under tension, his face turned to the heights, and then with great speed began to cross himself and bow. I think it was precisely in the exceptional energy of his religiosity that lay the main reason for his influence on believers. Somehow we have all become unleavened, for to use the expression of our savior, the salt in us has lost its potency. We are no longer the salt of the earth and light of the world. We have all cooled down. And then suddenly a burning torch appears. What sort of spirit he had, what sort of quality, we did not want to know. Nor could we have discovered if we lacked necessary knowledge. But the magnificence of this new comet, quite naturally, attracted attention. 
I, I would love to use red light here. It's awesome, right? Nothing bad about that. Except maybe not wanting to know what quality is because it's so awful. And you're probably, maybe that's, you have, that's the point you got. You guys talk about the direct electric, electric formation at St. Augustine. Just talk about the comment type stuff. Not like, not that we also have terrible sensor engineering. He's very disheveled. And whereas uh, thrift store sweatshirts, the class, don't mention that. It's because you should be here. He always, he always comes in Versace. But after he's got, after for every Versace suit he buys, he's given five to four. So he doesn't see that. Um, here's another, I'm um, just giving you more examples of recipe. Sophia, yeah? Just keep doing this, all right. In my estimation, he was a typical Siberian tramp, a clever man who trained himself for the role of simpleton and a madman who played his part according to his set formula. Please describe me as simpleton and madman. And you guys think now, why does Groshin keep wanting to compare himself to Rescue? Why does he keep things? What's wrong with him? You need to get some magnetic eye glasses. No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Here's some money. He did not. I, I actually am honored. I, when I first came to Augustine's, I gave a picture to Amy McNelly and Martha, two people who are both like sisters to me. I really love these people. But there was a very serious photo of me. I like taking serious photos. I like stupid, toothy smiles. It feels like just, I don't know, I hate that. Like, look like gravitas. And Amy and Martha thought I looked scary. <laughs> I'm like, that's good. I'm like, hey, that's a really good compliment. And they're like, we're nervous to meet you. I'm like, that's what I'm like, awesome. Like, what's, where's the downside here? I know, I, I don't want to be like baby bunny, fluffy bunny, soft, but he looks so sweet and nice. So I'm mean, like, he looks a little intimidating. Like, he's mysterious. That's what I want to go for. Um, he did not believe in his tricks himself, but he trained himself with certain mannerisms of conduct in order to deceive those who sincerely believe in lost oddities. Others, of course, merely pretended to admire and hoping to gain privileges through him. Okay, that's a different take on rescue, right? Let's keep these descriptions going. Love this. Seriously, we're out of time for the descriptions. I'm cool with it. Uh, Rasputin did not find everyone equally pleasant uh, because some Russian people had called him, quote, a clist and a sex maniac. Okay, clist is this. So that's probably one of them. That's because people don't, I don't have to explain, they don't have a high opinion of him, right? He's both a clist and a sex maniac and a servant of the Antichrist. Uh, this appeared on the, on the pages of Some of Life and the Voice of Moscow, these main papers. So the Moscow Paley, Pullman Daily News, uh, uh, op-ed about whoever, Clist, Sex Maniac, Sermon of the Antichrist. I'm pretty sure that person would be happy with that publicity in town, right? Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, coincidentally so, in one of the most interesting, prescient, and some people have said forward-thinking things, creepy things, he was, quote, a Russian Donald Trump. And people don't realize how, I'm just kidding. Um, that, that's not, that's not, that, that joke completely failed. I'm gonna withdraw that joke. <laughs> you guys are processing like, is he, is, is he seriously? No, that wasn't serious. Um, and Trump is not the best at all, for the record. Um, Vera was right, this woman. It was worth noting the people characterized the rescue as a mere nothing were almost always those who did not know him and had no personal experience of him. Rasputin was anything but commonplace. Okay, so you can accuse him of being a sex maniac and a horrible guy, but don't accuse him of being boring, right? He's not, he's not boring. Maybe he's the worst guy of all time, maybe he's the best, but he's definitely not vanilla. And the people that accuse him of being vanilla are themselves, surprise, surprise, vanilla. <laughs> um, and this has to be looked in the political discourse of namely the fact that Rasputin was the royal favorite. Right. I don't like it, Daddy, that people like him and not me. This isn't fair. That's a lot of the rescue comments. Yeah? So you said the first assassination attempt was by like a woman. And like, that's kind of sucks. I mean, assuming that she probably not. Not at all. Yeah, someone put the knife in her hand. She just said a peasant woman, right? So she was just like, like hey, Claire, you follow me. This right like, you want to kill this guy that we both hate? I don't hate him. Oh, you should hate him. Let me tell you why. I hear it's like it's horrible. Yeah. Typical kind of thing. Like I, I the other monk, Iliador, don't have the guts to do this. So I'm gonna hire someone, you know, yeah, it's terrible, horrible. There is little to be known about the origin of this man. He's a Siberian peasant, some believe a former prisoner, who apparently has a certain suggestive or hypnotic power and is a religious fanatic said to belong to the sect, sect of flagellants. That's the quiz again, the whip sect. He is believed to combine overall lack of education with natural talent and amazing knowledge of the Bible. 
A circle of women at the Imperial Court have been formed from which Rasputin recruits his female disciples. His most bizarre rumors are circulating about Rasputin's pursuits within this circle, and I am assured this magnetizer often acts there as intimate masseur. <laughs> and then the border between religious ecstasy and sexual perversity is not always clearly drawn. Yeah, so Rasputin kind of in St. Petersburg becomes kind of a sex cult leader. Um, so if we're, <laughs> if, if, if he's not a clist, he makes his own sex cult. Like, that's his defense. Excuse me, Your Honor. I never belonged to these people. I made my own version of it. It's not, don't get the story wrong. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I'm really sorry. Again, I, I mean this. I mean, God have mercy, God help me. But these are very serious things. I don't know why I find them so funny. <laughs> you know? I don't know. What is, what is, I don't, someone explain what's funny about this behavior. It's funny. Like, for some reason, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe you guys don't find it funny. Uh, 309. Uh, a couple more descriptions of Rasputin. Perhaps he is the only one who is correct in saying the recept receptive and gentle Russian soul, the easily enamored and artistic Russian spirit, and the powerful and unique Russian culture with all their estrangement from life's narrow practicalities open new horizons into life, possess an irresistible attraction, any attempts by other means to enslave us by their very nature leads to the opposite, a spiritual victory over them. So here's a very positive again, the Rasputin is this bright comment amidst the you know, squalor of the time. He's the only one who sees how to live, right? Last two descriptions of Rasputin. And the last one I'm going to read to you is the police report that kind of gives the his factuals. Last two descriptions of Rasputin. Um, Rasputin truly did come from the mud, but unlike his predecessors, he never left it. Um, were, he, were he to shed his roots um, and get himself made a prince, he would have lost the very thing that made him attractive. And Rasputin was too smart not to realize this, although he truly had no desire to leave his roots behind. In this sense, Rasputin was no social climber. He worshiped the Tsar and Tsarina, but had little time for nobles. Indeed. I'm going to eat with my hands, be very grimy. And I like that. I actually like that on its own. I love living like this, like a pig, pig in mud. There's that saying, right? Nothing happens in a pig in mud. I love being in the mud. So I like it anyways. But the fact that it's also advantageous, talk about how to partake in it too. I'm not some high class guy who has to pretend to be a, a low class person. Maybe this is a Donald Trump thing. And this isn't like, I support Trump, I don't support Trump. Trump is definitely not a common person. He's definitely of the elite. He has billions and trillions of dollars, whatever, hotel man, right? People accuse Trump of like pretending to be a common man, right? His baseball cap at Talladega, and he's faking it. Rasputin wasn't faking it. He actually was a common dude. He actually was from West Virginia, from Appalachia. And so it's a win-win for him. I like being, I love being this way. And it also wins me advantages, awesome. Here's the last description of Rasputin. I'm going to read you the assassination attempt. We're done for the end. We have 15 minutes left. So perfect. This is great. I hope I've whetted your appetite to learn about this. I will say really quick for the last uh, thing. If you're like Russian, so just can you please explain to me how this all factors in above all? Here's the two second answer. Guy from Siberia, how does he win? Um, influence the Tsar thinks he's the holy man of God. So does Tsarina. The miracle healings apparently engender him forever in the family. <laughs> What really happens for this class is when Tsar Nicholas, as I discussed earlier, when he goes to the front, who's left back in St. Petersburg? Rasputin with Alexander. Alexander looks at him as like her favorite brother, favorite cousin, best friend. So people start saying, and maybe rightfully so, Rasputin is running the country and he will run it into ruin in some ways. And so Rasputin's people see as the key active ingredient of taking that social rot that was in Russia and transforming it into one of the most evil things that ever happened in world history, the Bolshevik Revolution, all the horrible things of Joseph Stalin, and all that kind of trace their terms. That's my greatest argument that Rasputin actually was a servant of the devil. And that, that's how he's doing the devil's work, is he corrupts Russia from the inside out, makes the monarchy a joke. It's not true that he's sleeping with Alexandra, but if enough people think he is, it corrupts the idea of like the king and the queen and the people leads to the Russian Revolution and the, all the hundreds of million people killed in communist times. That's the import of this class. We're going to talk about the Russian Revolution. People say Rasputin causes it in some ways. Okay. When was Alexander deposed? Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. Uh, he, he abdicates March 15, 1917, the Iron March. Okay. Um, so just a few months after Rasputin died. Rasputin dies in December of 1916. Yeah, three months later, two months later, the great initial February, February Revolution kicks off, which really leads to the institution of the provisional government, Alexander Kerensky. And the eventual takeover of the October, less than a year after Rasputin dies, October 1917, the whole big Lenin Bolshevik revolution. And this whole, what we just said, this whole mess in the, in the country with the changing leadership, et cetera, 
that is what so severely weakened Russia? Oh, absolutely. What really so severely weakened Russia in the First World War is the Bruce Law Offensive. Is even when we win, we lose a million men. There's the Arty Times, the Kerensky Offensive. We'll talk. Remember, I love this class so much. I hope you do as well. I really love, love, love it in that we kind of were working on two separate tracks. Start off with a lot of theory, then we went chronology for like two months or a month and a half. We're back into theory. We're going to stay in theory, like individual personalities. Talk about Ali Fatima. We'll go back to the chronology again, really hard. And like we'll talk about. Remember, we paused. Remember that that, that review lecture I had. We paused at like 1916. We started all 17, 18 month battles. We're going to have lots of photos again, trenches, all that going back to Ashendale. We'll talk about the Kerensky offensive and stuff and all the kind of things. That is ultimately what weakens the Russian people. In fact, during the Kerensky offensive in the summer of 1917, a lot of soldiers just walking up to the enemy and throwing their gun down, just walking over them. I'm done. I'm not mm -hmm. going to fight. For the czars abdicated. This is over. This, this whole Russia, everything is just it's, it's over. I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to mm -hmm. be here for this. That is the ultimate thing. The Rasputin, you can say, corrupts from within. He's the moral rot from within that kind of brings down the monarchy. Is that giving one person too much credit? Maybe. But that's the traditional argument. That's why he's important to this class. Not to tell these funny or scandalous stories about him. It's like he really has a huge impact on war, on world history. Mm -hmm. Rasputin, to be fair to him, he wants peace. All right. That's an important quote to, to, to not a quote, but somebody realized he wants peace. He's one of the few people who advocates for peace in 1914. That's why people want to say that the assassination attempt he's done is that he believes it's bad. But like a lot of people, when the war kicks underway, Rasputin is so devoted to the Tsar and Tsarina, and that's true, he does love them and they love him. It's, it's a mutual, it's a requited relationship of love. And Rasputin is always referring to the Tsar as basically daddy, for lack of a better word, the shrug, you know, good father Tsar, your humble Rasputin, Novia, your little son. Uh, he becomes super war, pro-war because Nicholas is. But you know, he, he is kind of voice of peace at first. The media is always ripping him. Yeah, Claire, I mean, really clear comment. Thank you. It was so brilliant. It was so great. Great, like kind of theme for today. Yeah. Rasputin, like he just sells papers, guys. I'm not explaining. Like he sells the worst tabloids, the most disgusting stuff, mm -hmm. and serious stories and everything. Just like mm -hmm. again, I'm sorry to keep comparing him to Trump. I, I actually, if you ask me, do I think Trump Trump's first thing? I would honestly say all the excited, no, no, they're not, they're not that similar, actually. No, I wouldn't make the comparison. But the media phenomenon of Donald Trump post 2016, how many friends do you know who are pro or anti-Trump who got really involved in politics after I can't believe Hillary lost and right that, that night when Donald Trump was president? Trump was awesome for the media. The media loves him. The media, they're such liars. That's the big news. Oh, we're, we're sad. I read the Washington Post every day. I, and I say this, I gotta stop saying this. I don't like I'm bragging, like, ooh, guys, I read the Washington Post. Yeah, anyone can for like two bucks a month. Like it's not, it doesn't make me cool. Like that's not. You know, so I, I went to Harvard. Do you guys hear, hear of it? Like, why am I bragging about reading Washington Post? Anyone can do this. It's not a special thing. But they had an article yesterday, like, it's time to prosecute Trump again. Like, they just, they love Trump. And guess what? Most comments, the Trump articles. Trump is awesome for the media. If you want to know how Rasputin was in the media, think Donald Trump. Like, he's always in front of you. He always sold. They always want to know what's going on. And a lot of stories were like, oh, Sophia, you read that story about Rasputin? Well, I have something doubly scandalous. You're just, you're going to, it was total lies. And that's the problem. It's hard to separate fact from fiction for asking someone who's just liable. Okay, let's talk about Rasputin's death, the fateful plot, November 1916. I'm going to read to you from the book. That's how we're going to finish the class. I think you got a pretty good hold on all this. The idea to kill Rasputin began with Yusupov. Felix Yusupov is the worst example of the rot of the St. Petersburg elite, a guy whose favorite pastime is like decorating his palace. Like, does nothing, um, just a rich elite guy. He has peasant serfs who work for him. He doesn't have a, a lot of money. He has whatever is triple that. So he just can idle away his life. He's like, you know, the original housewives of Atlanta, whatever kind of people. Like, he just, that, that, he would be a reality TV star. So that, I'm saying Yusufov is a good guy. And he also very much into sexual perversion, Yusufov. But he just wants, he thinks, uh, he says right here, look, uh, the only solution is to kill this scoundrel. But there's not a man in Russia who has the guts to do it. If I weren't so old, I'd do it myself. One guy says to Yusupov. And then that's all Yusupov needed to hear this advice, to deliberately, deliberately prepare to murder a man in cold blood. Yusupov is a guy who's like, my life sucks. Did I mention it sucks? <laughs> By the way, I think my life really sucks. I hate just doing, moving this picture from here to there. And oh, another sexual tryst, you know, orgy, disgusting stuff. People obviously engage in this behavior, even if they don't have the knowledge of what sin is, know how, how awful this is, right? Know how self-destructive it is. 
Why, why is there your famous stories? People who are like AA or drug addicts who are like, yeah, don't do what I do. They mean it. They went through it. They know it's actually, it's actually bad. So I'm not telling you to avoid this because, hey, kid, you know, I had my fun. I want you to have yours. It's really bad. So this guy hates his life. His life is boring and meaningless, he feels like. So he's going to, here's how I'm going to, I'm going to atone for my life. I'm going to save Russia, right? Okay. Um, Yusupov writes to this woman, Irina, on November 20th, this is 1960. I'm terribly busy working on the plan to destroy Rasputin. It's now simply imperative or all, all else is lost. Not a word to anyone about what I've written to you. What is in our plans? Tell my mother to read my letter. So I guess mom, mom can say it. Tell them mom. On. Rasp, yeah, pass it on. Uh, please post this to Twitter. Uh, retweet it. Rasputin's killers all shared the belief they were preparing for an act of noble patriotism, but other motives were in play as well. All right? Plotting Rasputin's murder gave him one of these guys, not Yusuf, Maklov, different guy, a goal and an outlet for his energies beyond redecorating his family home. <laughs> I mean, it's literally just like, yeah, okay, my life, I guess if I, I either save Russia and become an international hero, by the way, this plan's going to go awful. Not only is it so evil, obviously it's murder. We're talking about killing, it's disgusting, period. Not even that. It's like, he doesn't even get props for it. People are like, yeah, we hate this guy too. We're glad he killed Rasputin, but you're like, Rasputin mini. We also hate you. Like, he, he's like, don't you guys love me now? No, we hate you. Then now we want to kill you too. Glad you came. This is just total. I don't want. I want the confession on Saturday. I don't want these profanities. I use too much profanity. An S blank 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 show. Um, <laughs> what really bothers me about Protestant stuff? I said all respect for my brothers and sisters. There is no worse saying in the world than "What the crap!" That is so like you should be arrested if you say that. Either say "What the f" and say it, and like I'm not encouraging that, but okay, or just don't say it. Like. Censoring like a word with a cheesy, like eighth grade sounding thing. What the crap, guys? Like, <laughs> like the cringe level of that is like, is like my organs are internally combusting. It's like so cringe. Like, just either just don't, I have an idea. Don't say this, don't say the profanity. Because profanity is bad. I said, every time I go to confession, I confess using bad language. It's bad to use profanity. But how about, so don't use profanity. Just don't say that though either. Oh, dang it, guys. Just don't, please. Brutal. Um, <laughs> okay. An even more pessimistic Tikamarov noted a few days on December 9th. So one of the conspirators. Yes, a revolution is developing and approaching. Now the top classes and ranks will get started and the workers and the peasants will fall in their own way. Who will survive? Only God knows. But one can imagine the one responsible, that quote, dark force, Represented by Grishka Raspi. Grishka is just a, in fact, my dad, Gratian, right? My, my name, uh, my dad called me Grishka growing up. The Slavs love kind of pet names. Um, so Grishka is also a pet name for Grigory. Um, it's like, his name's Anthony Raspi and Tony Raspi. I mean, you know, more, more like his name is Michael, they call him Mike, not even Mike, but that, that's Grishka. Grishka Raspi will manage to escape abroad at a critical moment. Um, Alexander, though, Alexandra, the empress, seems to cling even more tightly to his every word. She writes to Nicholas on December 5th to our, our friend's council. She calls him just friend, the way uh, um, Aquinas referred to Aristotle as the philosopher. Our friend, lovey, I assure you all is right. He prays so hard at night for you. He has kept you where you are, only to be convinced as I am and proved it to Ella and shall forever that all will go well. In Les Amis de Dieu, Friends of God, Play one of the old men of God said that a, a country where a man of God helps the sovereign will never be lost, and it's true. Our country is fine because I saw in this French play that if a guy helps the king and queen, everything's cool. So that's good enough for me, baby. That's what she's writing to Nicholas, her husband. She also writes to him, P.S. You look amazing in those pants that I so, so for you. That's a great look for you, honey. Can't wait to go home in our next date. It's really sweet. Um, she so wrote to, to Nicholas, <laughs> and he wrote back to. Every time I do abs, I think of you home soon. <laughs> they had a really good relationship. They were, they did. But he didn't say that. I, I'm just, I'm, come on, you're artistic life. I think they probably said something. Um, okay, this is creepy. Guys, this will send chills down your, your spine. I, on the 11th, December 11th, 1916, Alexander and the girls, who are the four uh, duchesses, the four Tsaritsas, uh, Anastasia, the most famous one, right? And the girls visited Novgorod. They went to pray in Znamensky Cathedral, where they were met by Archbishop Arsene, the one of this Orthodox monastery. He presented Alexandra with the icon of the Virgin Mary, and she gave it to 
Jirobova, one of her like secretaries or friends, as a gift for Rasputin. He was buried with Icon a few days later. He's going to be assassinated mm -hmm. on his tomb. That's not the creepy part. Wait, where is it? That's not, that's not creepy. They also saw the aged Staritsa, this aged nun, Maria Nikolanova, said to be 107 years old at this monastery. As they entered her room, Maria cried out, Behold the martyred empress, Alexandra Fyodorovna. Alexandra did not hear her words, but others in the party did and were deeply shaken by them. Hmm. That's really creepy. Uh, Alexandra is going to be the martyred empress a year and a half from now. This woman cries out, she walks in, Behold the martyred empress. Is she just a woman in her dotage, just seeing random stuff? I saw a cool video the other day, 103 year old woman who drinks a beer every day. Really cool. Her name's Millie. Freaking sick name, too. <laughs> South Carolina, Moss, Southern woman, epic. And she's like, I have a beer at four o'clock every day, doctor's order. She looks really beautiful for 103. Seriously. Her friend, who's like 40, was like, I'm jealous of her skin. I'm like, girl, you're right. Like, your skin is great. Um, beer every single day. Is this one is an older woman just saying stuff? You know, old women say things and old men say things, right? But, or is she, is she prophesying? <laughs> Sophia, you're right, right? People say stuff, right? That's true. That's kind of indisputable. Uh, Rasputin writes a, a creepy letter um, to Maria, to one of the, to, to his daughter. A disaster is threatening us, great misfortune, terrible will be the wrath. The day has come for our country. Brothers will be slain by brothers. The earth will tremble. Famine and pestilence will reign. Signs will appear to men. Pray for your salvation. And through the grace of, his, of the Savior and of her who intercedes with him, you will be consoled. Here's what Douglas Smith writes about this. Rasputin's prediction of coming disaster is not pathetic. By December 1916, many Russians can see the bloody revolution staring them in the face. But his knowledge of his approaching death is striking. He cannot be argued away. Perhaps Rasputin did indeed foresee the violent end just around the corner. Uh, remember the first day of class, the, the letter I read, wrote, wrote, or wrote to you about Rasputin? Uh, when he said, right, you know, if, if, if uh, I'm killed by, if I'm killed by, uh, what was it, peasants, everything will be fine. But if I'm killed by one of your members of family, you know, 25 years of bloodshed will come and the prophecy works perfectly, the prophecy. Like, yeah, that's, I don't know, but he was just lucky or, or whatever. That's creepy, right? Or maybe, or maybe again, God of mercy, maybe he was evil. And so he, like, the devil can recite scripture perfectly. So maybe if it's a prophecy, it means it's a holiness. It could be bad as well, right? I mean, right? Um, anyways, here's how Rasputin dies. Ready? Uh, okay, and then we'll leave. I'm sorry if I, if you don't mind, if anyone has to leave, go to class, thank you. We're at 53. I can't believe we're always done early. We're going to come back a little bit over here. Shortly after midnight, the motor car carrying Rasputin and Yusufov pulled into this, this house, all right? Why is Rasputin baited to this place, this murder scene, this castle? Because he's told he can hook up with someone's wife. I'm dead serious. So it's come back all the way to the end. He's told like, hey, my wife, she loves the, she's a big fan of yours. You can sleep with her. It's terrible. As Rasputin and Yusufov, that's why he put on this perfume, this nice suit. He's like, yeah, it's my lucky night, right? Again, awful, awful, awful. As Rasputin and Yusufov, this guy, this duke, right? Enter, Yankee Doodle dad, Dandy could be heard on a gramophone amidst the murmur voices. Dead serious. Rasputin asked whether he was having a party. Yusupov assured him it was just some of his wife's friends. They'd be soon to leave. They went down to the cellar, removed their coats, sat down and talked, and drank some tea. Yusupov offered Rasputin the poison cakes, which he at first refused and ate one after another. Yusupov could not believe his eyes. Rasputin showed no ill effect. The poison did nothing. Next, Rasputin asked for some of his blood and Madeira wine. Which Yusupov gave him eight, which was laced with poison. Yusupov stood and watched, waiting for him to collapse any moment. But just as with the cakes, the poison wine was having no effect. Three glasses he drank, and yet nothing. Yusupov grew nervous. The two men were now sitting across from each other at the table, their eyes locked. Now see, an angry Rasputin suddenly let out. You're wasting my time. You can't do anything to me. Yusupov felt certain Rasputin now knew why he had invited him to his home. But then he got up and spying Yusupov's guitar on a chair and asked him to sing him a song. Yusupov obliged seemingly one that another Russian did. The time dragged on. It was now 2.30 in the morning. Nervous what his friends upstairs were thinking, Yusupov excused himself, saying he was going upstairs to check on his wife and his guests. He comes back down. Yusupov changes the subject, gazing at a large Italian cross of rock crystal above a cabin. He says, Grigory Efimovich. And Russians use the middle name. Trish, what is your middle name? Marie. Marie. Trish Marie. Patricia Marie. Like that, it's like a formal way that Russians address themselves. Grigory Efimovich. You'd better look at that crucifix and say a prayer. With that, Yusupov raised the revolver and shot Rasputin, who screamed and collapsed into a bearskin rug. With the sound of the gun, the other men ran downstairs. There lay Rasputin, bleeding, blood spreading from a wound in his chest, his body motionless. All right, they leave him, they go away. In 
the meantime, Yusupov and Persikevich, another conspirator, waited and congratulated themselves on having saved Russia and the dynasty from, quote, ruin and dishonor. And then a strange feeling swept over Yusupov. He went back downstairs to make certain Rasputin was indeed dead. He felt for a pulse, nothing. But then as he turned to leave, he saw something. Rasputin's left eye was quivering, his face began to twitch. The green eyes of a viper, Yusupov wrote, staring at me with diabolical hatred. A terrified Yusupov stood, his feet frozen to the flagstones of fear. With a sudden violent effort, Rasputin leapt to his feet, foaming at the mouth. A wild roar echoed through the vaulted rooms. He rushed at me. Remember, he says he'd been poisoned and shot, trying to get at my throat and sank his fingers in my shoulder like steel claws. This devil who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There is something appalling and monstrous in his diabolical refusal to die. I realize now who Rasputin really was. It was the reincarnation of Satan himself, who held me in his clutches and would never let me go until my dying day. Yet with a, quote, superhuman effort, Yusupov managed to free himself from Satan's grip, charge back upstairs. They call for these things. They chase Rasputin's guns are drawn. Perskovich fires off two shots, then two more, just as Rasputin was about to escape out into the Moika River. So when they come back down with his guns, he's gone. He's running away. Rasputin tottered and then fall next to his snowbank. Yusupov approached the body. Finally, he was dead for certain. They fire like you know, a bunch of shots into him. After their return, they wrap his body in um, linen, a bunch of stuff. And they take him over to the bridge and toss him into the icy water below. I felt full of courage and confidence, Yusupov wrote later, at the thought of the first steps to save Russia had been taken. And he's thrown in the river. His body is discovered a day or a couple days later. And then apparently the legend was that there was still water in his lungs. That's not true. He definitely died from mm -hmm. poison, getting shot a bunch of times, or a combination of both. That was the end of Rasputin. And Dave Schmidt quickly points out this happens immediately. Not two months later, the February Revolution. The, the famous one is the October one. We we'll talk a lot about this class. That's the Bolshevik Revolution. But things really go haywire in February because that is when Nicholas forced Abdi to be So the end of the Romanovs is like with Rasputin. Do mm -hmm. have any questions before we go? What happened with the family after they found out? You so far and those people? No, like the Romanovs. Like, what did mm -hmm. they? Oh, they were deeply distressed, very angry. They're completely infinite at this point in certain mm -hmm. sense. Nicholas Stone, Alexander was horrified. She was like, like her son had died. She loved, truly loved Rasputin for better or for worse. God bless her. She was so blinded by how you like you tricked her, you know. They were very angry. Things there's not enough time to like plan some kind of to put the people on trial. The revolution happens like the next day, it's been a couple months. And the sad end of the Romanovs will talk about eventually they're taken, you know, in custody and they're shot in cold blood, you know, in this in this place now the church was built from the top. The church of the holy martyrs. I think Nicholas is like beatified in the Russian Orthodox Church. He's a saint, he's a passion bearer. Uh, Tsar Nicholas is stock in modern Russia way up. Modern Russians will love Nicholas II. He seemed like he, he, he died for Holy Russia. The royal family's opinion in the age of Putin now is very, very high. Like during communism, it was like, well, we've dispatched people, but now it's like, well, the czar is doing this, like never been hotter, never cooler. You know, like wherever that's from. Sorry, right now. Oh yeah, like Nicholas, they're, they're super, super chic. Like they're awesome, you know, we love the Romanovs. Every Romanov documentary I've watched, it's like 6,000 likes, one dislike. They're all like, just the cool people. I'm dead serious. Like Nicholas was so handsome, blah, 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 like kind of fanboy, fangirl type style. Like they're so cool. Like with people like Kate Milton and, and uh, William, like that kind of love almost. But yeah, they're very, very popular. There's a um, have a good day. Keep going. There's a nice uh, Netflix 